Hello, 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 and welcome back to episode five of Collaboration Corner. Collaboration Corner is a project that we created here at The Flare to invite artists in to have conversations and change the way that we have conversations in our production spaces. I'm loving this project. We've given the cast 12 weeks, 12 scripts from a story I wrote called The Love You Make. The series takes place in 1968 and shows how a group of unexpected friends face all of the chaos that this year presents to them. I am loving this experience. This has been such a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful time. I'm so happy with how it's turning out and this cast is spectacular. In today's episode, we talk about alcohol abuse. We talk about story structure. We talk about band names a lot. We talk about relationships. We talk about racism in friend groups and in supposedly good environments. We talk about all of that fun stuff and more. As per usual, if you've been keeping up with us, you can check out all of our social medias right here. Follow us, like us. If this is your first time watching an episode, be sure to click the cards there, there, and see all of our previous episodes. Get up to date. There's so much coming, but so much is already out there, so go check that out. And again, as per usual, be sure to go check out our Patreon. Support us in any way you can, even a dollar helps, honestly. <laughs> so without any further ado, ladies and gentlemen, here is Collaboration Corner of the Love We Make, part five. So let's get right into it. The Love We Make, chapter five, May 1968, or life's a bit better when you dance to the music, don't you think? So we fade in, the music cue is a beautiful morning by the rascals. Hazel stands in the foyer with the phone to her ear, waiting and listening. Rich and Diana wander up to the front door. Some guy walks past him, brushing into his shoulder and knocking him off balance. Evelyn sits on a bed while on the phone, talking and talking with Phil beside her. He's wrapped up in a book with an arm around her. She hangs up the phone and leans on Phil. Hazel hangs up the phone and slumps back down. Jim enters the den and sits beside her. He has a half full glass in his hands. He finishes the drink and looks at Hazel. She shakes her head, gets up and goes up the stairs. Valerie opens the closet and pulls out the paper bags. She throws them into a massive black plastic bag. She's rested on the bed. She ties up the bag and sits down on the edge of the bed as Charlie enters the room. He goes to the dresser, grabs a joint, and leaves her alone. Title card, The Love You Make, timestamp May 1968. Charlie is asleep on the counter again, no surprise. Hazel enters, it just means to take off her coat. She tosses it over the counter, then goes to the record player and turns it on. Music cue, she's a heartbreaker by Jean Pitney. Hazel goes over to the counter and sits on the edge. She gently shakes Charlie's shoulder. I'm awake, asshole. Oh, sorry. Sorry, did you hear about the protest in France? Yeah. It's a bit like Les Miserables, huh? What? With barricades and... Forget it. What were they protesting? Surprise, surprise. The police. It's nice to know other countries are struggling too. Makes all of our troubles feel more universal, like we're all in this together. You make it sound like a Tupperware party. You've clearly never been to a Tupperware party. Rich enters in a hurry. CJ, Hazel! I have the best news. I was talking to Walt last night about the band. We're good. You know, we're, 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 we're doing well. I guess this boss must have been listening and he called me about us and offered us a gig. You're kidding. Uh, this seems very sudden and oh, look at that. I'm suddenly having difficulty breathing. Come on, we're ready. Well, who's going to be listening to us? Thanks, man. Hey, we don't have a name yet, Rich. You're a fucking idiot. Why are you so crabby today? Don't look at me. I have no clue what's going on. He was fine just a few days ago. He was great, actually. Ever since that sit-in. The one he ditched. Yeah, I'm still fucking pissed about that. Look, Charlie's like one of those swinging things on a clock. A pendulum? He's like that, swinging back and forth. What makes him swing the other way? <laughs> What's so funny? He likes to keep secrets. That's all I know. He's not really good at... You know what? Let me rephrase. He's not really good. The most he's ever told me was Eric and the accident. What accident? I, I can't tell you something. He doesn't want you to know, Hazel. Hey, you have a name yet? Confusing baggage? Evelyn enters the shop. The bell rings as she opens the door. She puts down her umbrella and shakes it out. Good morning. How can you people be so cheery in the morning? Drugs, probably. Excuse me, I would never. <laughs> Are you okay? Yeah, I just feel like someone's sitting on my chest. You want some water? 
No, no, I'll, I'll be fine. Evelyn, you're creative-ish, right? Want to help us come up with a band name? Band name? Why do you need a band name? Well, the Beatles are holding a contest to rename themselves. What do you think, Evelyn? You're in a band? The three of you? We have a winner! <laughs> Why? It's fun. <laughs> we haven't done much, though, and we don't have a name or music to perform, but we do have a performance coming up, thanks to Rich. When is it? Later this week? Later this week at some point, I guess. So we need a name and music to perform and an audience. Yeah, and some courage. You know, I think we really hit gold with the last band name. No, we didn't. It was an awful name. It was ironic. No one wanted to hire us. So we call the band Always Performing because we're amazing. Then we'd just be lying. You could name yourself after something. What if we just call ourselves the band you're about to hear? <laughs> then we're not lying. But, but naming it after something will make it memorable, right? Uh, and cheap. Evelyn, it was nice to see you. But you should probably get going before Charlie punches a wall in. Well, I wanted to talk to Hazel, actually. Um, do you want to go outside? Sure. Hazel grabs her coat and makes for the door. Evelyn starts at which her beat, then follows Hazel out. Outside the graveyard, Hazel shuts the door of the shop behind herself and Evelyn. She has her raincoat on and pulls her hood up as Evelyn opens her umbrella. What's going on? Did you get the result back finally? I'm sorry. Evelyn. I took your advice. I went back and got another test. And it's the same. The same. I need you to tell me everything's going to be okay. Evelyn, everything's going to be okay. We can fix this. I can talk to dad. I'm sure he knows someone who can help you. It'll be underground, but that's okay. I know people who have been okay. It's mostly safe, right? You're going to be okay, Evelyn. I promise we can just keep it a secret between you and me until we can fix this. And I don't want to talk to your dad about it. it. I don't want you to talk to your dad about it. If you tell him, my mom will find out. He'd never tell her. But someone would, Hazel. I don't know what to do, but I don't want anyone to know until I figure this out. You don't have a lot of time. I know. Can I help you? We can weigh pros and cons together. I don't even want to think about it. You have to. This is literally life or death, Hazel. Give me some time to come to terms with it. God, I, I thought you'd be more supportive. What's there to be supportive of? I'm pregnant, Hazel. I'm going to just stop there. Does anybody have anything they want to say about anything that just happened? Yikes. She's pregnant, Hazel. <laughs> she sure <Pregnant>. is. <laughs> she sure is. Just so everyone knows, I still haven't named this goddamn band. So if anybody has any, any ideas, they're more than appreciated. The damn the chaos zone. The chaos zone. I like confusing baggage, honestly. That, <laughs> that works for me. Damp spell is worse than dry spell. I'm sorry. I think it's amazing. The damp the moist spell. spell. No. Moist spell. No. Yes. Honestly, I think that one's better. Moist spell. Just mm. Name it moist. M O R. S. I support. I support Charlie and his <laughs> contribution to the naming of the damp. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, then you could do moist towelette, like, and then that's it. And just that's the whole thing. <laughs> Ew, I think moist towelette is at the top of the list right now. No, it's oh, not. Towelette is, is a worse oh. word than moist. It's a nasty word. Just say towel. I don't know, towelette. moist towel seems way worse than moist towelette. Moist towelette, for some reason, just sounds more clean than yeah, moist it's just towel. a little bit of moisture on a little bit of towel. It's just that moisture. little bit of French that makes it clean. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. Uh, can I pitch in about something that had nothing to do with the band name Please. or or whatever we're talking about? <laughs> in that scene, we have more alluding to Hazel having a lot of anxiety there. I was picking up on that. Obviously, when I read the script, I could see that it was there, but I felt like watching it come to life, I could feel it as someone who does struggle with anxiety, especially when it, it keeps coming back up just like subtly. I don't think it's being like pushed in your face, like, hey, hey, she's feeling really anxious, but she just kind of like 
peppers in like oh it's fine it just feels like someone's sitting on my chest what's up but the, I was like, but what else what what I like the the little bit of alluding to it and I feel like that's been building up a little bit throughout the series so far I really like the way that Hazel's anxiety has been kind of manifesting because we are only recently starting to put words to a lot of mental illness and and like anxiety and all of this stuff is is starting to be more in the zeitgeist now and, and talked about more than it ever has before and in the 1960s you know people didn't have the words to describe what was happening to them i thought that was really when i read when i read it through the first time i thought it was really kind of it was very truthful the way that you used things like oh i feel like someone's sitting on my chest because we don't we don't have words like oh my anxiety is acting up you know people aren't talking about like anxiety in the same way because it's the 60s and and so it, it it felt nice to be like oh yeah okay we're only starting to talk about these things really truthfully in the 21st century but they are human problems that have been going on since the beginning of freaking time so they definitely were happening in the 60s that's a mm -hmm. good point too and i like the trailers like you want a, some water like <laughs> oh, just rub some dirt in it kid charlie and rich have done these performances so much so it's like they don't understand or f forgotten what it's kind of like to like you know have to go through that for the first time and throwing hazel into the fire and everything they're not they're not being super empathetic as empathetic as they could be being but uh, that's a really good point where in the 60s it was just like and still sometimes today I was doing a lot of research into mental health in the 60s and the early 60s was when they really started to close down the institutions and there was a rise in, for lack of a better term, shrinks. There was a lot more showing up on the scene, but people, especially the higher class people, were still like, this is for crazy people. So uh, we're going to talk about that. It's so important, especially because like, look at the world that they're in versus the world we're in. Like. The only difference is now we have names for things, or we now usually use the names for things. Are we good to keep going? Does anybody else have anything to say? I did just want to mention, there was a lot going on in that scene, but I wanted to point out that in the stage directions, Evelyn is staring at Rich the entire time she's in the groove yard. Just yes. staring at him. Yes. And then when he finally looks at her, she looks away. Would that be maybe the second time in her life she's actually seen a person of color up close? When I got the sides for this part, I really clued in on the fact that she was freaking out about Hazel going to Harlem. And she, Evelyn never says anything about people of color and, and Black people, but she just was like, you're going to Harlem? I know what happens in Harlem. And I was like, okay, I know exactly what that means. I know what kind of person Evelyn is. It, it, it probably is one of the first times that she is interacting with a person of color up close and she only knows what she's heard and she is she, she's a rich white woman in the 1960s when i first read this script that was the first thing i noticed was like oh and it keeps saying and she's staring at rich and she's staring at rich again and then i remembered like we talked about last week you know within the group there may be some problems <laughs> with racism you know in different forms and it, i think it's a an interesting reminder that it doesn't always have to be someone like blatantly using like hate speech or something like that like sometimes it's just really subtle things that are ingrained in because she is a rich white woman in the some subtle microaggressions you know it's it's things that are ingrained in her she might not be saying anything out loud but it's like you can tell that she is uncomfortable yeah for sure. I always thought of Evelyn as the racist character. And I imagine there are a lot of racist characters in, in the 1960s. Yeah, what you're saying about even like within their group and the microaggressions for sure, because obviously Evelyn's not the kind of person to get violent. And I think she might even be too nervous to actually say something directly, obviously outwardly racist, but she's definitely got that prejudice going on. I mean, Evelyn's kind of a likable character to me. She's not like Dawn or Lois or one of the other characters that kind of have like an insane vibe about them. She's very like innocent and like nice. And so you might expect this more from like the other characters who like to make off-color jokes and stuff like that. But 
I, I like that it that it's coming from her because racists aren't always mean people. Racists are your friends. Racists are people who are trying their best, but they're still racist. Um, they're still racist. Yeah. It can come from anybody. You never really know. Not everybody who supports Donald Trump and not everybody who's racist is a stereotypical monster. Some of them are people, which is kind of scarier to me. Well, like we talked about a couple weeks ago, the microaggressions aspect of things where it's like not everyone is going to be blatantly outright racist, especially Evelyn, who's grown up in a household where it's like, you're a woman, you don't get to talk unless you're spoken to sort of thing with the heavy restrictions of the gender roles and just what she would have grown up around. So you have those microaggressions and the uncertainty. But like you said, it's not always going to be the blatant aggression that we sometimes see. So I think it's interesting to explore the contrast between the smaller acts of racism with the characters versus like the more outright acts of racism like rich getting body checked while he was walking with diana i agree with everything you guys said good job <laughs> <laughs> does anybody else have anything they want to add to this conversation i am reading all of your name ideas i don't hate some of them Stay tuned for next week, I guess. I'll, I'll pick one. You don't like the moist toilet? I'm team missed connections. I really Yeah, what about, about missed connections? Hello? I said I didn't need like all of them. I really like anyway. missed connections. It's, it's, your, it's your piece. Aerosmith, like, I'm with it. Aerosmith, that really that's the with you. Good job, Will. <laughs> I'll find a way to make something work. Hear me out. What about the insects? The beetles? The insects? Hear me out. What about One Direction? But we hate them. What about wrong direction? <laughs> Two directions. New directions. Bisexuality. <laughs> Hint to bisexuality. A pendulum. New new direction. Only goes in two Glee. directions. Glee. So we call oh. it pendulum. Pendulum. New, new directions oh, yes. is, is run by Will Schuster, played by Matthew Morrison. <laughs> Literally, good the night. Night. Good night. No. Well, we get back to this. We get back to the script at hand. Thank you so much for all of your ideas. I reject most of them. But thank you in We're all fired now. <laughs> John sits on the sofa with a cup of coffee. Florence comes into the den and stands in the archway, watching too. Recently, the Viet Cong and North Vietnam attacked South Vietnam in 119 locations. As well, though unsure if these events are connected. Five journalists were murdered in Saigon by what is believed to be Viet Cong soldiers. Lawrence turns off the TV. Everything's so morbid these days, John. There's no use in paying it any attention. If the front oh. door opens, Jim and Hazel walk in, carrying shopping bags. Oh, good, you're home. How was your appointment? Fine. It was nice to get out of the house, wasn't it? It was nice to distract ourselves. I tried to twist dad's arm into seeing a film after his appointment too. The Odd Couple is playing and that was a great play. I, and I thought we needed a good laugh. We should see The Odd Couple. Jack Lemmon is a national treasure after all, but dad said no. Mary really enjoyed that play. Do you want a drink, dad? That would be nice. Goes into the den, she goes to the bar cart and reaches for a bottle, but there are none there. Where's the... Gone. Bonnie helped me clean it all up. Is she here? I sent her home for the night. Jim, it's Friday. Let the lady live. She has her own family, for Christ's sake. We had a lovely chat about her nieces. Wonderful dancers. She says one of them is training with the American Ballet something or other. It starts with a T. Terrible at names over here. <laughs> I always wanted to dance, but I never could. I can keep talking if you'd like. You know I'm good at it. Anything to distract you from getting angry at myself or Bonnie. I could have taken up tap dancing at one point, but my ankles were too weak. Enough. John, I'm going for a walk. Would you care to join me, Hazel? John grunts as he stands. Florence stares at Jim as she and John leave the den and go out the front door of the house. Hazel, would you uh, go upstairs and put your things away? What's going on that uh that concert you were talking about when's that tomorrow night why do you want to come i'll uh, i'll be at the office why even ask them well if i wasn't at the office what if i needed you hazel with the election and and mom 
And now grandma and grandpa are here too. There's so much going on, I get it. You're prioritizing, that's fine. I can take a back seat for now, I'm not upset. Why would I ever be upset? Hey, 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 what's gone into you? I'm doing something exciting and cool and interesting and you're more hung up on whether there's alcohol in the house and if LBJ's gonna give you a call. He's not calling you. You're just a deputy, I'm your daughter. I'm literally your flesh and blood. I'm your only daughter and you could completely care less. Weren't you just arguing with me about whether or not I was going to go to college last year? And now you couldn't give two shits about where I am. Excuse me? Would you like to keep living here or do you want to leave? Sure, I can stay with someone else. I have friends, do you have friends? I only ever see you around people you pay and the phone. Hazel grabs her back from the foyer and runs up the stairs. As soon as she's gone, Mary sits down beside Jim. What was that, Jim? What did you expect me to say? Jim, she's 19 years old. She's figuring it out. She can't say things like that to us. She needs to go away for school. That'll knock some sense into her, some responsibility. It didn't me good at her age. She doesn't want to go, Jim. We have to respect that. It's her decision. Maybe her decision is wrong. Jim, you're so stubborn. You both have hundreds of things going through your heads right now. That's okay. Her going to college should not be your number one concern for either of you right now. I know you're using it as a distraction, but Jim, we can be honest with ourselves. I'm not getting any better. Yes. Yes, you will. Let's be realistic. I worry about you too. There's, there's no need to worry about me. I know you've been drinking again. I could repeat to you what the doctors said, but I know you won't listen. Just promise me, whatever happens, whenever I go, you'll look after yourself too. He looks at where she was sitting, now empty. In Hazel's bedroom, she lies across her bed with the radio on. Her collection of records has grown exponentially in the corner of the room. A poster advertising the dry spell playing at some bar lays across her dresser. Knock at the door. Yes? What? Can I come in? I thought they got rid of all the alcohol. Bonnie left one bottle and a note saying you and I need to talk about me. What? Are you a murderer or something? Do you never sleep? Are you a vampire? Am I a vampire? <laughs> no. This has to stay between us. Okay. Who would I tell? Okay, it stays between us. It's a very long story, so I'll keep it brief. Hazel starts to open the bottle of wine he hands to her, tearing at the gold, gold foil around the cork. He reaches out and stops her. Okay, now I'm concerned. Your mother hated how much I drank. It's a part of the business. Every meeting, someone pours a glass. I, I, uh, I, I cut back a lot for her and you. But when she got sick, I, uh, the doctor is concerned that I'm, well, he called, he called it a disease. What is? The, the drinking. Oh. Are you okay? I will be. I promise. I'm holding you to that. Have I ever broken a promise? Well. I promise. So, should we get rid of this? You should. You could ask Henry Price if he wants to share a bottle of wine. Dad, I swear to God if you bring up Henry Price one more time. I just think you'd be a good match. But hey, what do I know? <laughs> it's 
stay on topic, Dad. You're okay. I'm okay. And now you know everything. I know everything now? Well, maybe not everything. But you know as much as I know. Thank you for telling me. Yeah, well, you're smarter than me. You were going to figure it out eventually. So now you're saying I know more than you. Oh, no, 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 no. Let me take that back. No, absolutely not. <laughs> you're too smart for your own good. That's your fault. You didn't let me watch television unless I read a chapter. And look how much it helped in the end. I reference books all the time and no one knows what I'm talking about. It's not my fault you're a bummer. Excuse me? Where'd you learn that slang? You made me watch your shows after you finished those books, Hazel. The Monkeys, Leave It a Beaver, Petticoat Junction, The Dick Van Dyke Show. What is wrong with Dick Van Dyke? You make me watch Bonanza on Star Trek every week. Hey, you like Star Trek. I like parts of Star Trek. <laughs> we want to take a short pause and talk about that. Oh, Ow. man, that's... My heart. I need to speak about... I knew I was going to need to speak about this when I read the script, but the line where she's like, we both know I'm not getting better. I was Every time I'm like, oh, I've been stabbed in the heart. Oh, I've been attacked. The way that... Mary is integrated into the story. You never know exactly what her timeline is when she's there. Because you're kind of just like, oh, this is a memory of her. But you don't know exactly when. And so the fact that that's just kind of like, oh, you know, we, we had an argument. And then she just drops the bomb. And you're like, oh, oh, she's dying. Like, we knew she was dead already. But for some reason, this still hurts so much. I'm guessing we can start piecing together as to when these conversations are happening, though, right? Yep because of little giveaways. So I'm taking it this was about a year ago. Yeah, about a year and a half. A year and a half ago. With this, this is when they were saying about the argument a year ago about college, right? With, without, you know, being blunt about it, with all the morbidity of dying and, and all that sort of stuff that you have. I think it's nice that you have the dynamic shift after the talk about the alcoholism. I think that's really, really nice. I think that captures a lot of the family essence of what used to be between Jim and Hazel. It's still in existence, but I think it's one of those things that, like, he's keeping himself to himself. I empathize a lot with Jim, but he's the sort of person that when he's got problems, he's the only person that can solve that problem. He's the only person that knows he can do this work and stuff like that and keeps everything else around him. What he feels like is in a bubble, but actually he's pushing everybody away. It's like he's trying, trying to protect everything, but actually what he's doing is that. It's not that. Alco alcoholism is really it's prevalent everywhere, and I, I think he's, it's right that you put it into the fact that it's a part of business. It's a part of, you know the coercing, the, the the chatting to people within business and stuff like that and making deals and all that sort of stuff. It just makes me think of Room when it happened from Hamilton. Thank you very much. I personally would like to see that scene explored a little tiny bit more. There's so much skirting around what he's actually trying to say that I think that maybe the point of what is actually he's trying to say is being lost a little tiny bit. Because when, when I was reading it, there's, there's so much stammering and so the morality and the mortality of what he actually is sort of thing but yeah that's I'd, I'd love to see that sort of explored a little tiny bit more maybe little tiny changes but i love that scene that scene is really nice especially the end i was like oh my god this is just gonna go down a rabbit oh no it doesn't they bring themselves out of a rabbit hole that's really nice the original scene that i edited down to this was a lot more specific to the point mm -hmm. and didn't have the ending there but we were talking about how he wasn't being specific and kept saying like no 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 I'm, I'm fine don't don't worry but like it's hard for him to express how he's feeling mm -hmm. so I was sort of going yeah. that route with it and like a lot of well, all of the characters are based on people that I know so the person that comes to mind sometimes when I'm writing for Jim I think about like the the interactions I've had with this person and so much of this scene is based on that yeah so that's kind of where my mind was going with skirting around the fact he doesn't see this as something that people need to know because this is his problem. His, his business. Yeah. yeah. I actually think it's really interesting that you say that, Jay, because I was going to say, wow, it is so excruciatingly painful to watch Jim struggle to find these words. In this whole script, something that you do very well, Aurora, is talking about big issues without just dropping words for effect, it took Evelyn a really long time to say, I'm pregnant. And Jim has not said, I am an alcoholic. Because people don't 
say that as much. I mean, especially especially in the 60s, from what I know about the, the culture of the 60s, is that people were a little bit more secretive even than they are today. Well, the 60s was when the time that al being diagnosed as an alcoholic was starting to come into, into fruition, wasn't it? That's why they're not really sure about the fact of his disease or whatever. That's why he's really ambling around saying it and taking it as well, yeah? Exactly, yep. Yeah. I thought it was really powerful and i felt as the audience i didn't miss the point at all but i also get that as the actor in the scene it would be really easy to feel like you didn't get your point across because you you know when we when we're not the, our most articulate selves and we yeah no i get you look back i think it's, it's like, probably oh. just me it's probably just me because i like to articulate my point as jay but like as jim it's difficult do you know what i mean well and the thing is jim is probably kicking himself for stuttering so much yeah probably right after the after the scene happens i think the fact that you feel that way as the actor i think we saw the character feel that way we saw the character be like, I'm not communicating this properly, but I don't know how to communicate it properly. I think there, he was frustrated with himself. Then Aurora, it's just me, babe. The writing's great. <laughs> well, does, anybody, does anybody else have anything on that specifically? Uh, that uh, yes. I was honestly thinking that like it's almost too short of touching on it because he has the book of dialogue where he starts talking about like him drinking and stuff like that is really great. And then she asked two questions, and then we're talking about Henry Price. Uh, yeah, that's kind of what I mean. There's so much skirting around it that it just gets sort of jumped over. And I think right, that, yeah, yeah. it might be something that you do will explore in a later episode. Yeah, like maybe we can like revisit that. it or something like that yeah. for sure. Yeah, no, it is something that will be talked about more later, definitely. Also, yeah. you got me really concerned that Jim is the one that's going to die, by the way. You got me really concerned, Danae, because do I ever break a promise? Please, no. Please, no. I, I... Who's it gonna be? Hey, AJ, no. don't stop. <laughs> <laughs> I just only found out recently. I, I don't want to say anything, but he never breaks a promise. Okay, I'm so... holding you to that. Do you never break a promise, Aurora? I think it can definitely be fleshed out a little bit more, but I also mm -hmm. think that's the point of his character right now in this moment. You get him to the point where he's like, okay, we got to talk about it. And then you get a little bit out of him, but not quite enough. And I have a lot of men in my life that are like that. So I really felt it. It's a conversation that needs to be reoccurring. And I, I have faith that you're going to bring it back to that. But it's just, you get a little bit more each time. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. As I said, I, I did write a lot more in depth the first time and just felt like it was too much. So I, pr I probably did pull it back a little bit too much. So I, I will- Swing it back like a pendulum. Ha ha ha. We should just call the band the pendulum. The other way. Have That's you thought about joke. doing the complete opposite in the sense that he, he doesn't discuss it whatsoever until it's a little tiny bit, like not too late, mm -hmm. but until he's gone so far down the rabbit hole that it actually needs to be confronted by that point. There are earlier drafts where that is the case, mm -hmm. but I felt like it was important to have that moment where they could have that connection because so much yeah. of their relationship has been like kind of pushing apart so they could have that kind of coming together moment mm -hmm. and then things will spiral more. No, good. I was wondering because it was interesting to me if it was just explored in this sort of opposite and mm -hmm. how that has influenced on it now. You've set a really good precedent and a really good balance as to how Jim is going about this, this problem that he has. It does need to sort of keep sort of being ex explored a bit, tiny, a tiny bit further. But yeah, it might even just be like a little tiny pepper or something. It came with a sound effect. I don't know why. But, <laughs> uh... <laughs> can I, can I <laughs> Thank you, Nancy. <laughs> Can I zoom in on a little nuance that I noticed? Of course. Um, there's something really cool you did in the text, Aurora. It says, he says that I'm, and then he pulls back. Well, he called it a disease. So there was like a moment where it sounded like he was going to say I'm sick or I'm an alcoholic, but he makes it something that's kind of separate from himself. And I just find it incredible that you are introducing a new sickness that's so prevalent you know, these days, like alcoholism, you know, so to be witnessing a conversation where they are trying to find the language and he doesn't have it. This is such a cool discovery. Alcoholics Anonymous started in the 1930s and it is 
not an easy thing for especially men to admit that there is a weakness. And it is a disease that is still considered a weakness rather than a disease. And even in the, you know, the 50s, the 60s, you still didn't admit that kind of thing. When I read it, that's how I can see it. I really like hearing all the different varied opinions and thoughts like that. When editing this, I will look at all of the options you guys have brought forward and the ideas you guys have brought forward because, yeah, I think there's definitely a lot more that can be explored and a lot more that could be sort of weaved in there. Thank you, everybody. It's a very good scene, though. Thank you. Thanks. I appreciate that. It's one of the ones that I edited far too much and drove me crazy, so I'm glad. Are we good to keep going? Does anybody else have anything to say? Anybody have any new band names? Someone said the Pendulums. That I really like that one as well. That's a good one. <laughs> Because then it relates to the rest of the of the script too. I like that. You that was cannot that change that your opinion. Me. You have to stick with missed connections. You're gonna change what you like, Mateo. I am a very multifaceted human. No, being. I have many interests. I have I have many opinions, and they can all coexist within me simultaneously. Listen, like the pendulum, he can swing back and forth as he feels. Hey, thank you, thank you. Thank no, you. Mateo, you gotta, you gotta make Sophie's <laughs> choice. No, Sophie's choice. What, <laughs> is it really uh, what about just Phil? <laughs> well, I'm glad that joke landed. Okay, anyway, that's good. Keep you going. can keep that one. That's good. Feels good. We'll keep going. Thank you, friends, <laughs> for that. <laughs> Music Key Mrs. Robinson by Simon and Garfunkel. Charlie and Hazel are both putting some records away while a few customers look around the shop. Rich enters the bell ringing. CJ, I figured it out. Figured out what? How to enter a room without making a scene? I got a singer. We don't need a singer. Babe, I'm sorry. We voted. We need a new singer and you're not cutting it. Wow, thanks Hazel. You voted in that? I just nodded when it was brought up. Great, another coup. Who'd you find? Diana. Oh, she sings in the church choir. So we're doing hymns now? Man, trust me, she's got a wicked voice. Nina Simone bows at her feet. I've been listening to her since we were 14, man. She's spectacular. Yeah, fine. <laughs> Great, so you'll ask her before practice today. What? Your idea, man. I don't know if I can stay for practice today. I'm just not really in the mood. What? Why? What's going on? Family stuff. Your grandparents still around? Yes. It's not with them, though. Just stuff with my dad and Evelyn. The show's tonight, you know. Oh, I know. I'm just... I'm tired. I'd like to sleep before performing for the first time in my life. <laughs> <laughs> so glad I have such nice friends. <gasps> you have friends? <laughs> <laughs> You're not funny. <laughs> Just walk away, Renee. <laughs> hey, baby, I should sing. You're both assholes. Should we be worried? Stay here. So in the basement, Hazel stands over the record player holding a record in her hand, staring at it as Charlie walks down the stairs and stops. Everything okay? Good record. You want me to put it on? What's going on? Charlie! Uh, you know, uh, I've been through my share of shit days. That, that's fine. Just, you know, if, if you need anything, I guess um, I, I, I get it. Thank you, Charlie. You're my best friend. <laughs> the spot is taken, dude. What about Evelyn? She's always off with Phil and she has other things going on. Yeah, I think I know what's going on there. Yeah, but she hasn't figured it out. And I have to keep lying to everyone for her. Here I was thinking she was going to have to lie for me this year. Nope, I'm not the disappointment anymore. She is. I went from being the rebel without a cause that everyone liked to gossip about to being Debbie Reynolds. Sometimes she swears, but America still loves her and Evelyn's turning into Bridget Bardot. 
And then there's Dad, and I promised I wouldn't tell anyone, but I don't know if I can keep it to myself. What am I supposed to do? Is your dad okay? He says he will be, but our house is like a jail right now. Feels like we're locked in and always being watched. Feels like 1984. It's all newspeak and double think. What are you talking about? Forget it, I'm just ranting. It's not very ladylike or professional. Fuck that. You gonna go ahead and get a drink? I never want to drink with you again after the last time. Yeah, that's fair. Why is everything so hard? Why can't things just go the way they're supposed to? Thanks for letting me talk, I guess. Well, you talk a lot. Everything's fucked up. Yeah. Welcome to the real world. Evelyn sits on the sofa in their perfectly poised living room. Their pieces of china on display and plates hanging on the wall. Pictures of their perfect family decorate the walls and every surface. Evelyn fidgets in, in her seat as Catherine Foster enters the room. Why are you just sitting there? I'm waiting. Can I wait with you? Catherine, I... Oh. Mom. Yes? I was wondering if you would mind if I went out with Henry Price tonight. He wants to surprise Hazel. The last time you went anywhere with her, you ended up in jail. I didn't go to jail. Yes, you did. Evelyn, the answer is no. While you live under my roof, you will not see her. Do you understand? What if I move out? I mean, it's about time, isn't it? And where would you live? Are you getting married? Will someone provide a home for you? Evelyn, you are not ready for that. How do I know until I try? Hazel has been a terrible influence on you. Who do you think you are? I just want to see the world and- There's an atlas on the shelf. You can browse that. And Catherine, I can see you laughing. Your hands are on a wall. Cut it out, young lady. I have an idea. Catherine, I don't want your ideas. Well, fine then. I just wanted to help you. How could you help me? You're still a child. I sneak out every Friday. Did you know that? No. No one knows, because I'm really good at it. Are you sure you don't want my help? Okay, I'm listening. Charlie walks into the near-empty bar with his guitar strapped to his back. He looks around at the hole in the wall, the stained carpet, small tables and chairs, and the long bar, and lets it aside. It's better than nothing. An older bartender stands behind the bar, cleaning a few glasses. You with Rich? Yes, sir. You can set up over there in the corner. Charlie nods, makes his way over to the corner. Hazel enters behind him, carrying her guitar case and a bag with some drum kit bits in it. She looks over and smiles at the bartender. He just nods back. She goes to the stage where Charlie is and puts everything down. Hey, what do you think of your first venue? It's not what I expected, but I think it'll be okay. What are you expecting? Buckingham Palace? That's a little too much. Hey, you have an admirer. No, thank you. Give him a chance. He may be your knight in shining armor. Or not. Right. It's that waiter kid. Why does everyone only want to talk about Henry? Rich enters, carrying more bags, nods the bartender, makes his way to the stage, sets the bags down, and sits on top of a speaker. Ugh, that's everything. What are we talking about? Hazel's love life. Oh my god. Oh, that dentist or something? Henry. Hey, I say if you like a guy, you should tell him. Right, Charlie? Yeah. That's enough of this. Music cue dance to the music by Sly and the Family Stone. We go into another montage. It, it basically, I, I, I don't need to read the whole montage. Really, the whole montage is just them setting up the band because it's funny. And at the end, they're playing and everybody's there. Lois, Walter, Carolyn, Don, Henry, Phil, Evelyn, and Diana are there dancing. And they're playing She's Not There by the Zombies. The song comes an end and those dancing cheer and applaud. Rich goes to Charlie and puts his arm over his shoulder. We kicked ass! It was amazing! They were dancing! You were cheering! You sounded like Jim Morrison. And you, you put Ringo to shame. Well, that's not hard. <laughs> you! You! Me? You were fucking brilliant. Valerie walks up with everybody. You were amazing! Wraps in a hug, lifts her up the ground. She then hugs Hazel. She looks at Rich, then quickly looks away. Don and Walter pat Rich on the back while Carolyn hugs Hazel. Lois stands off to the side. Good show, man. Bosses, please. Thanks, Walt. You blew me away. Another hug. Don goes to Hazel and wraps an arm around her. <laughs> the little girl is growing some balls, huh? Goddamn miracle. I'm really.
really proud of you guys. Really proud. They hug. They go off. Karen grabs John's arm and walks them both over with Walter and Lois at a table. See, you're pretty good. Thank you. They wrap their arms around each other. Diana pushes her way through and pulls Rich into a tight hug. Oh my god, you were rock stars. What the hell? Yeah, you think so? You, miss, are a star. Oh, thanks. Hey, Di. Well, if it isn't the king of the assholes. (laughs) (laughs) Do you forgive me for leaving now? No, but I can move on for now. Uh, So, um, Di, you sing, right? Yes, and I'm pretty good. She is. I can vouch. I heard her singing around the house the other day. Band has decided I'm not a good enough singer for some songs. Hmm. Would you like to sing in the band sometimes? Yeah, I'll think about it, Charlie. <laughs> <laughs> Have a drink, Val? I'd love one. Charlie and Valerie walk off towards the bar, hand in hand. Rich and Diana start laughing again and chatting quietly. Charlie and Valerie sit down on two stools at the bar. I'm really, really proud of you, Charlie. Walter brings over two tall glasses of beer and places them in front of Charlie and Valerie. Charlie nods and takes a sip of his as a teenage boy walks up beside Charlie. Man, that was out of sight. Thanks, dude. So I was talking to Roger. The guy who set his mustache on fire trying to light a joint last Easter? Yeah. No, please bring him up at every given moment. Well, he doesn't have a mustache anymore, but more importantly, he and his friend Jeff are starting their own recording studio. Oh. I don't know much else, but I can call him up and ask if you'd like, if you're interested. No, uh, yeah, I am. I I don't know if we're ready yet, but yeah, I'm definitely interested. Just wants to add Diana to the mix. I don't know if she'll agree. I'm sure she's busy with her kids and everything, so we'll need to work all that out. But but yeah, yeah, that could be rad. Thanks. That was a long-winded way of getting to, uh, sure, uh... I think she's rubbing off on you, love. Shut up. Henry pushes his way over to the bar and waves at Walter to get his attention. Hey, it's the waiter! <laughs> Not tonight. Okay, I get you, man. Hey, man. Yeah, I'm um, talking to you. Am I talking? This is all in my head. He's clouded by love. Get him one of these. So, Henry. You like Hazel? <laughs> I, uh, sh- she's, uh, <laughs> well, she's great. Uh, we've known each other for so long, though. There's no chance. There's no harm in telling her how you feel. I don't want to hurt her. She's been through enough shit recently. <laughs> A guy who cares. Now that's new. Hey. Boy. Who tells you you'd hurt her? I don't know. How many more chances are you going to have? Hazel talks about you a lot. It's getting annoying. Put us out of our misery, man. I'm feeling very attacked. Good. Can I have that drink now? Or four? (laughs) Walter drops Henry's drink off. Charlie grabs his drink stands and nods Henry over towards Hazel. Valerie gets up and follows as they push through the crowd. Henry takes his drink, takes a massive sip, and follows them. Meanwhile, Hazel is packing up her guitar when Don walks up carrying two drinks. Look at you. Why are you all alone? Drink? Oh, no, thank you. I'm all right. Come on, just take it. Um, all right, then. Thank you. I didn't know you were coming tonight. Better than staying in. Staying in can be good, especially when it's with people you like. For example, my family and I have often stayed at on weekend nights and we have a very enjoyable time listening to records or just talking about our days. Some of the best days are spent in, I believe, you know, in your own space. But you never get to meet anyone if you stay in. Evelyn and Phil push through the crowd. Hazel! Oh my god, you came. That was so cool. My best friend's a rock star. (laughs) Hi, Phil. Hi, Janice. I took some photos of the show. Hope you don't mind. No, not at all. I'd love to see them. 
I told him they'd be good for your first record. Charlie grabs Rich and Diana in the crowd and pulls him, pulls them with, what? Pulls him with them towards Hazel. Sure. Thanks so much for coming. Of course. I mean, I may have broken my mother's heart in the process, but it was worth it. How are you feeling? Hazel. Yeah? Look who we bumped into. Hi. Hi. Everyone turn away and look busy. What? May, <laughs> May I buy you a drink? That would be very kind of you. I had one, but it was kind of gross. I wouldn't mind another. He nods and gestures towards the bar and after you type away and they walk off. Diana looks over at Dawn, still sitting there with two drinks. He raises his hands in defense. That wasn't so hard. It sounded like a business deal. Over at the bar, space is starting to clear out as Walter hands Hazel a drink. Henry sits beside her. Rather drapes her arms over Charlie as the two watch Henry and Hazel. <laughs> okay, what is this? Try it. Oh my god, that's so good. The Mai Tai. You like it? Yeah. So, what'd you think of the show? It was really good. Yeah. Probably the best show I've ever seen. That's such a lie. I'm being honest. And you... You shine. Oh. Thank you. Ellie nods the whole group over just a little closer. Everyone migrates just a, just a few steps closer. So, do, do you remember that night a few months ago when you had a bit too much to drink and... Yes, I do? God, I was hoping you'd forgotten. I'm very sorry about that. Not my proudest moment or moments. Oh, no, it's okay. I, I wasn't mad. Oh, good. I'm glad. <laughs> yes, I, I am too. This is awkward. <laughs> it's very awkward. But I think it's okay. What's okay? Awkward. Well, only if this goes how I think it's going. And how's that? Well, I think you're going to ask me to go on a date with you. And if that's the case, then my answer would be yes. Is that the case? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yes, 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 that is the case. Oh, thank goodness. I was worried for a moment that you were just going to completely turn your back on me. I wouldn't dream of it. <laughs> I think they just heard everything we said. We did! <laughs> Music cue blue eyes by Don Partridge. Hazel and Henry walk up to the front door, followed closely by Evelyn and Phil. The spare room is still open if you want it. Uh. I don't think I should. I'll just walk home from here. Mom doesn't know I snuck out. I'll drop by tomorrow. Get a room. You sure you'll be okay? <laughs> I'll be fine. <laughs> if you're sick again, you call me. I will. Thank you for coming tonight. I'm glad I came. Best night of my life. He quickly kisses her, then lets go of her. Oh. Phil smiles and nods to Hazel, then starts to walk back to their car. Oh my god. I know. The door behind them opens. They both turn. Bonnie stands there. Hazel. Oh, hi. I won't tell your father. Come in. I made tea. <laughs> Do we want to take a slight pause and talk about all that nonsense? That was so much fun. My face hurts from smiling. <laughs> Don is so much worse with him being in the room oh. and in the face with Hazel. <laughs> I'm cute. Believe me. Believe me, it's very uncomfortable. <laughs> <laughs> Up from my sorry. I gotta say, this is like my favorite scenes. So weird. This I is really why, cool. Who is more disgustingly cute, Henry and Hazel or Evelyn and Phil? I know you all been waiting for this for so long, but I've just been maniacally squealing and, and laughing at this whole scene because it's so like perfectly awkward. And Henry, poor Henry, he's trying his <laughs> best. He's like, oh, wow, yeah. Yes, I was going to ask you that. How did you know? Like, I'm like, Henry, honey, you're <laughs> trying so hard and I love you for it. <laughs> I feel like before everything that Hazel's been through throughout this whole show, the conversation would have gone much less to a finite end. But like, because she's matured so much throughout the show, she's been able to be like, 
this is what you're going to do. And I'm going to say yes. Exactly. I picked up on that when I read through it. I was like, she's stepping up. She's yeah. like, you're going to ask me on a date. I'm going to say yes. And everything's going to be good. When I was reading it, I was like, whoa, so much is happening. And then seeing it come to life with everybody going, I was like, this is actually really cool. I really want to see this like on a screen. And I really like the moment where Charlie's like, everyone acts like you're doing something. That was accurate. <laughs> That was very accurate. It was fun to just sit there and be like, I'm yeah, just watching. I tell us more. <laughs> when Phil is just like, oh my God, if you throw up even once, you have to call me as if that's not every man with a pregnant girlfriend or wife ever or every man with a newborn baby. Oh, I'm sorry. You need to breathe. Let me do it for you. <laughs> also, the fact that Bonnie saw everything. Love that. <laughs> she was just like, Bonnie's all-knowing. I think yeah. she is. Bonnie knows everything. Are we good to move on? Does anybody have anything else they want to say? No? Good to go. I just want to add, we need to protect Henry at all costs. If Henry <laughs> dies, done. Yeah. Correct. If you kill Henry out of all these characters, but what kind of a monster would do such a thing? I, I can't. British television Henry, for you. Henry is... <laughs> Henry is so, oh, I can't not love Henry. He's just like the best parts of everyone kind of condensed. He's really- That's why he must he, die. He needs to learn, he needs to learn how to- yeah, Classic build him up so you can He's not- He's the heart. Him. Yeah. They do it in British shows all the time. They make him the heart and then they- Yes, and then they, they do. Away. If there is an option to either kill off Jim or Henry, take Jim, take him. Yeah. Wow. Honestly. <laughs> He's like, he I is a tribute. cherub. Oh, I do. Hey, the thing is, I don't think Hazel could like get through I'm here. losing Henry or her dad. I'm so if either one of them die, I'm like, I'm really curious to see what Hazel will do. My oh, money's on, on Richard Charlie. 100%. It's Evelyn. She's going to try to do some weird abortion thing and she's going to die in the middle of it. The this is not uh, spring awakening. I, I keep okay. thinking of the spring awakening the thing. Oh my god. Oh, I keep thinking Evelyn's gonna get right. Evelyn's gonna get Vendla. <laughs> Mama! <laughs> me. Mama! Wow. <laughs> Charlie and Valerie walk down the street arm in arm off in the distance somewhere down Partridge still place. I'm really proud of you. Thanks. I know we've been really shitty recently. But we're okay now, right? Yeah, I think so. I love you, Charlie. Yeah. Charlie, you can tell me to fuck off. I just need you to say it back. Yeah, I... I feel the same way. I will do, for now. Up ahead, a small group makes their way out of a restaurant, chatting quietly. She gets the side of his head. Eventually, I'll get it out of you. The group makes their way over towards Charlie and Valerie going towards a car. One of them, Brenda, leads. Excuse me? She and the group squeeze by. She and Charlie make eye contact. She stops in her tracks. Charlie grips Valerie's arm and starts walking away faster. Brenda stands there staring at him as he goes. Holy crap. Music cue is Think by Rita Franklin. Diana and Rich stand in her tiny kitchen, both with cups of coffee. He has a cigarette in his hand. So, what'd you think of that? You're very funny. So you don't want to sing with a real life band? Oh, did the Supremes call? Rock and roll band, Diana, rock and roll band. There's nothing rock and roll about you. Oh yeah? So what would it take? You do other people's music. You want to be rock and roll, you have to do your own music. I have my own music. That does the band. He reaches into his back pocket and pulls out a miniature notepad. He flips through a couple pages and hands it to Diana. What's this? Songs. Poetry. No. Songs. Poetry. Fucking Alan Ginsberg. You're turning into a beat. Yeah, fuck off. Shh. He'll hear you. But those are good, Rich. You should show Charlie. I'll never go for it. Well, if I do join... Then I'll back you up. You won't say no to me. And Hales is afraid of conflict, so she'll be on our side too. You just gotta back him into a corner. No, I don't wanna put him in there. Stop, stop, no. You can't be so afraid of him. I'm not afraid. Yeah, you are. That's why you need me. I smack him into shape. So you'll join the band? I said if. Please, Diana, be my Superman. Shut up and finish your coffee. 
You know who else can fight for me? Who? Valerie. Oh, what that bitch do this time? <laughs> Jim sits on the sofa in the den, head in his hands with a pile of papers on the table in front of him. Bonnie sits on the love seat, going through a, a file in her lap. Can we move forward, Jim? Would you like some coffee? Yeah. You're doing really well, Jim. She goes off towards the kitchen. There's a knock on the door. Jim gets up and starts for the door. Hazel comes running down the stairs and gets the door first. Oh, are you getting it? You can get it. I'm just waiting for someone. Hi, Mrs. Foster. Is your father in? Good morning, Louise. You look awful. Thank you. Can I speak to you alone? A car pulls up outside the house. Hazel looks out, then looks at her dad. I'm heading out anyways. Grab your bag and tries to squeeze your way out the door. What can I do for you, Louise? Where's my daughter? What? Bonnie enters, carrying a cup of coffee. Evelyn keeps disappearing. Where is she? What's wrong? Do you know where she is? Would you like a cup of coffee, Mrs. Foster? Music cue to take care of my baby by Bobby V. Louise stares at Bonnie. She then pushes past Jim into the house and follows Bonnie into the kitchen. Jim looks after both of them, takes a deep breath, and shuts the front door. Hazel and Henry sit across from each other in a busy restaurant with plates of food in front of them. They are laughing. We intercut that with videos from the protests in France. Rich sits in the basement with a guitar over his shoulder and a notepad in his lap. He scribbles something down on it and strums a few chords. We intercut a news report of the Scorpion submarine sinking off the coast of the Azores. Ellie sits in her car alone. She wipes her nose and leans back, closing her eyes. We intercut news of the Cantonville 9 burning draft notices with homemade... I can never pronounce that word in the palm. For Evelyn lays on the sofa, crying. Phil cuddles her close. He whispers something to her. Hazel and Henry stand outside the restaurant. He fumbles his car keys and drops them, and she laughs. Charlie sits on the counter all alone. He looks around the deserted store, then slides off the counter and goes down into the basement. He goes down the stairs and sits, watching Rich strum the guitar and write. And Rich looks up at him. End of part five. Yay. Do we have any thoughts? Things we want to talk about? I'm the one that dies, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she was wiping her nose. And at first I was like, oh, no, she's crying. Why is she sad? And then I was like, oh, no, that's not what it is. And then there was like the comment where it's like, what did that bitch do this time? And I was like, what did I do? Oh, no. Yeah. <laughs> no. Who is Brenda? Who the fuck's Brenda? Who the fuck we'll is have Brenda? to wait and see. Oh, that got me shook. I was really excited by that. Good. What a great introduction of a new character. She yeah, I, be I, like I didn't like a look, and you're like, who's that? And then you don't get any answers this episode. Just goes, holy crap. I read that scene. It broke my heart the way that she has to like pry out of him and, and he still doesn't say it back. It was just so heart wrenching, especially because they're brought into the series already being a couple. And so you assume they've been together for a long time. It's probably fine, even though we continue to see more and more that it's not fine at all between them in any way, shape, or form. But the fact that she can't even get the I love you back still, that hurts. I feel so bad for Val in that moment. It hurts just because you see this <laughs> beautiful, strong, powerful, sassy woman begging for the love from a man. It's just this phenomenon of these these beautifully wonderfully strong women and that's the one area of their life where they find that I guess they're the weakest it's it's this vulnerability there that is so interesting to see in Val because it contradicts everything you see everything how she interacts with other people and then when it comes to Charlie it's she gives in to him in a way that you don't see with her do with everybody else and it's just it's it's heartbreaking to see her do that for a man who uh, he can't tell her that he loves her back. If you can't say it, do you really mean it? You know, I mean, he can say, yeah, I feel the same way. But if you feel the same way, you should be able to say the words and you should be able to say it with your whole chest. I love you. Mm -hmm. And he can't do that. And it, it makes you wonder why is she still here with him? What is it about Charlie that's making her stay he's one of those guys that's just a complete beautiful disaster. He attracts that part of you that insecure part of you that is falling for these men who are not treating you the way that they should be treating you. <laughs> I feel like Charlie's the kind of person that people see and they're like, oh, he needs my help and I can help and I can like fix him and make him better. It's that toxic exactly. male, the toxic male. Such a, it's such a 
human truth and I don't know what it is about it. The, the strongest, most well put together, smartest ones of my friends always end up with the people who are the most messy and toxic and disastrous. Yes. There's this, there's this sense of like achievement of like, I want to be the one to fix this person. I see it everywhere and I don't under, I can't understand it for the life of me because it's like, you're such an amazing person. Don't you deserve to be with somebody who's gonna like treat you well without you having to like crawl on your knees begging for it. I don't, I don't understand what it is about that that really attracts us, but it, I think we've all been really attracted to somebody who is a disaster. <laughs> and I, I don't understand what that is, but, but there's something about the Charlie Val relationship that really kind of speaks to that. During this time, like also codependence is coming about on the like the national scene. I think it's like either the 60s or 70s, I'm not quite sure, um, and like Alan you know, have experience with alcoholics or just, you know, having to take care of people. It becomes a, a behavioral cycle. So codependence, like, is a real thing. And people really try to protect people because that's how they derive their own self-worth. I just also think it's interesting. Al-Anon, I mean, I'm probably fudging the numbers, but I think it was created around this time, same time for, as like a support group for people who are in relationships with people who are either like chemically dependent or, you know, have some variety of mental illness. But anyway, I just think that's really interesting because I think like I could see Val doing that and I can see a few other people who have those behaviorisms. And yeah, so that's just something that interesting ties in. Yeah, it's um, it's really interesting because playing the role, you sit in the, the flip-flop of power a little bit. In a previous episode, he was terrified she was going to leave him. Like he was terrified he was going to lose her. And she had all the power to go. I like left that episode being like, why does she stay? And I think it's because she thinks he's scared to say it. I think he's scared to really invest just to like lose her. And I think that's what she's telling herself. I don't know necessarily if that's exactly what he's feeling, but I think that's what Wait, she's worked into her head. I don't know anything about Eric. Nothing. Yeah, what is going on with Eric, man? What's what's up with that? Those were my sides. Those were my sides. Brenda. I think part of it too can be I know for so many women who get caught in relationships like this where they're either abusive or they're begging for attention and affection they sometimes don't believe that they're deserving of that love or that they are good enough. And even if they maybe present themselves as these amazing, powerful, strong, confident people, like Mateo was saying, I know growing up, that was something I did a lot. And inside I was really, really not. And I know a lot of these women, and I think for Valerie as well, especially because of you know, all the, all the drugs that she's hiding and all the secrets that she has, there's probably a lot of shame in there and she might be feeling, you know, okay, well, this is all I deserve. I deserve to be with someone who I have to beg to be told that I'm loved. I, I think it's really interesting you say that, Becca, because I also think that there's a lot of that in men as well. There's Absolutely. a lot of men who don't believe that they are worthy of being loved for themselves unless they are able to provide, unless they are able to be pillars of uh, strength or of so someone to look up to and admire and someone to be powerful and in control. Society has set up the expectations for men in such a way that I feel like a lot of men, and I know I do, doubt their own inherent worth. And if they're not able to provide something for somebody, they don't feel worthy of that person's love either. Because we were told, you know, that, that like the man's role is to provide and to be able to work hard enough and have enough to go around. It's a, it's a material wealth thing. It's a confidence thing. It's a, a leadership thing. And as, and as men, it's like, we're, we're told that if we don't, tick those boxes, the love that we get from people is whether we tick those boxes for them and not for who we are as people. And, and I feel like that's a, the root of a lot of toxic masculinity is this belief that who, who I am as a man isn't worthy of love 
because men don't love. Men are strong, men are manly, and we provide for everyone. And that, that attitude, I think, is also on Charlie's side. And I think that it, it manifests differently in different genders. We're seeing this story of two people who are just really, really afraid to be loved somewhere deep down don't feel worthy of having that love. And that's, that's, I mean, I also don't know what happened with, of course, like Eric and Brenda. That's what I see in Charlie that, that I relate to. I can't tell you I love you because I don't believe that my love is worth anything. I, I've actually like personally literally been the Valerie in in the relationship. I was with this this gentleman for about five or so years off and on. I'm actually not allowed to say his name in front of my mom at this point. Oh my um, goodness. I noticed actually like towards the bitter end of it all that he would only ever say I love you if I had already said it to him and like initiated the exchange. So one day I just stopped saying I love you. And we never said I love you ever since. <laughs> that could be something that like she is feeling too. She's going to get tired of trying to pull it out of him at some point, And she's going to give up on that. The next question is, does she pull at me and become complacent and just kind of like be in a relationship because she wants to be in a relationship and she wants to be quote unquote happy and how they're supposed to, you know, get married and do X, Y, and Z. Or is she going to be like, okay, no, like I do deserve better. You know, we can all hope that we deserve better. <laughs> I've seen firsthand like what it's like from the male side, I guess. Unfortunately, the person that my brother was with was the mother of his child. And since they've been apart, it just shows how sometimes that toxic person that you're with that makes you feel as if you're not valid enough to have that love it shows how a person can like flourish when they're out of that toxic environment my brother is one of the hardest working men ever he constantly is providing for his son in so many ways and I applaud him for being a, a teen dad he's doing amazing and seeing him out of this relationship now he is able to do that 10 times more. And not only is he able to just provide for his kid, but he's able to provide for himself. He goes to therapy. He goes to his doctor's appointments. He just got promoted to supervisor at his job. And he loves his job. He loves where he works. Whereas this person that he was with would always constantly belittle him and be like, you're, you're, you know, you're terrible. You're not going to be a good dad. You can't provide you everything you do is just so bad for us as a family and he believed it he didn't think he was worthy of that love now that he's out of that I've never seen my brother happier it's amazing and it shows just how important it is to talk about specifically men's mental health men's mental health needs to be talked about more yeah I could talk about this for hours it, it just needs it there needs to be a focus on it and now that he's been allowed to focus on it because there isn't a person telling him don't focus on that you can't focus on that you just have to go to work which you're terrible at doing anyways now he's like no I can go to therapy I can go to my psychiatrist I can talk to my dad about difficult things I can open up to my sisters about things now and he's a completely different person than he's ever been it's amazing I adore my brother. I love him. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that story. That that's a really I really like that story. That's a beautiful story. And and I, I think it is so, 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 so true. I feel like honestly, honestly, from the bottom of my heart, I believe that every single freaking problem in this problemized, problematic, messed up society, every single problem we have stems from insecure men who are not having their emotional needs met acting out and taking out their own problems and their own insecurities on other people because they don't know how to deal with their emotions. I, I believe sometimes like, it's not specifically the man's fault too with you saying that. Sometimes it's people yeah. putting this weight on anyone's shoulders of just be strong. No, it's okay to not be okay. It's okay to cry sometimes. It's okay to show emotions. I cry a lot. It's okay for anyone to cry a lot. Crying is so oh. fascinating to me because it's so like, 
I guess it's such a personal activity in some instances. One of my friends is like, you know, if something goes wrong, he's like, oh man, I feel like crying. It's like, do it, cry. People like we cry for a reason. It's, nobody accidentally cries. And then it's like, oh, whoops, here come the tears. It's like, it's, it's a coping mechanism. that's like biologically proven to help you cope with the situation. That's why we do it. So we can cry. And there's tons of crying coming. Oh, oh, well. I'm excited. I'm already. No, everything you guys are saying is exactly, 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 exactly. The title of this piece, The Love You Make, actually comes from the Beatles song, The End. And the line is, and in the end, the love you take is equal to the love you make. So y'all are really like hitting the nail. Everything you're saying as well about mental health, especially mental health in men, is something that is so important and is important to this story as well. So that is all going to be touched on. I, I have been planning towards talking about mental health so it's coming up and i'm really pleased that we're talking about this now this whole series is really a manifesto on the condition of the world it just touches on everything what it really is doing a, a phenomenal job of so far is showing how all of these issues are interconnected because mm -hmm. um, they are they so are and they all come from the same human flaws that we all have that we haven't quite figured out how to deal with. And different generations figure out how to deal with them in different ways, but they all have them. So I'm really excited to, to see the crying parts. It's exciting. I'm looking forward to having the conversations about it, definitely. Bring on the deep shit. I like that. I like the deep stuff. Bring right. it on. Yeah, it's... It's something I'm really passionate about. I'm glad we're going to be talking about this because we have come a very long way in being able to talk so openly about mental health issues. But I can firsthand say there are still so many stigmas that I feel like it's something that it can always be talked about constantly because, you know, more things are coming to light. We are, as humans, are constantly evolving so new things are always coming forward. So we always need to be talking about these things in order for people to understand them. So I'm excited about these talks about mental health. I have a quick question. Uh, this goes with the whole mental health stuff that's going on right now in terms of the story. Because we're talking about Charlie, you know, dealing with all that stuff. And with Rich, Rich is also trying to build his confidence more because, like, from what I've been reading, it kind of seems like, you know, Rich, Rich is, like, the accommodating friend. You know, he's always there for a good time. And he told Hazel he's mad. Now he's got Diana saying, are you going to write your own music? Are you going to do what you want to do? And now he's doing it. And then we ended off on Charlie seeing him, like... Is there about to be, like, an ego trip from Charlie? Like, what's about to happen? Are they both about to, like... Are they going to break up the band or the missed connections or the cotton swabs or the... <laughs> Who suggested or the, the cotton the swabs? Mi the, mi the mildew lords? Are they separating? Like, what's happening? I, I swore to not say any spoilers. Of course, of course. So I cannot say... Okay. You slapped, you clapped. You were like, all right, he's on to something. I saw. Okay. All right. I'm here. I'm here. Yeah. Also completely unrelated before we end this gym dig. Um, just want to say, Des, love your hair. Hope you win everything that you, you ever look amazing. Win. It's about time y'all said something, okay? I was like, I, I was gonna comment on your own. Ain't nobody comment on my hair. I wanted to comment on your own. <laughs> and I was like, how do I say this? But, and like, I, we started right away. And I was like, how do I work? <laughs> I was going to send you a DM. Yeah, okay. It's literally in the same frame of mind. <laughs> honestly, I was just like, I was, gonna, I was finding the right time to go, Dan, your hair looks lush. <laughs> so is anything related to this project, this story before I stop recording? Anything? Protect Henry at all costs. You can't say that. You are Henry. Hey, we I have to say, say it. Let me do it. Protect, yeah. Henry, let me at do it. Protect yeah. Henry at all costs. Protect Henry at all costs. Let me do it. Protect Henry at all costs. Protect Henry at all costs. Let me do it. Protect Henry at all costs. Let me do it. Protect Henry at all costs. Let me do it. Protect Henry at all costs. We need to put money on this bet. So maybe sure. we can do that in the Please. chat. Henry dies. Fantasy. I, I'm sorry. I would like to make Charlie, Charlie and Rich get in a car crash. End of the bet. That's my bet right now. <laughs> 
Gia do? No. But only one person dies. Only one person dies. One Never mind. One it's of not them dies glorious anymore. anymore. I take it back. I die. The, what, the social media aspect of the flare dies. Yeah. <laughs> but, but, guys, that's what we can't tell you. Aurora. Just, I die. 